think I've ever had a vocalist on before. Okay. So I was hoping like, oh, maybe like they know have vo- they have mic technique and I don't have to like coach them for yeah. a minute before before we actually go a on. little bit. Although I'm an opera singer, so I yeah, don't so usually perform mic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So perhaps you don't you haven't had enough experience performing with microphones that you do have per, per, uh, mic technique per se. Well, it's funny. I actually, I think I have more mic experience than most because some of the work that I do is a little unconventional. I do um, off-Broadway immersive theater. That's sort of where oh, okay. I made a lot of my a name for myself. And when you're in a venue where your tracks are all recorded and there's like a thousand people milling about, you're mic'd. But oh, yeah. I, I've been, it's body mics and, and in-ear monitors. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. So. <laughs> mm. yeah. There's a lovely studio you have here that's half uh, uh, an accountant's office. Yeah, and, thanks. Uh, <laughs> well, at least there's a nice big, you know, bay window and lets a lot of light in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Which, I mean, oh, God. I, I don't, I can't remember the last time I was sweat this much doing a podcast. <laughs> but, because mm. it's, it's still January. I know. But it's 60 today and yesterday. And as much as I am thankful that I just have, I don't have to wear anything other than a t-shirt going out. It's, I can tell we don't have air conditioning in this, in this. Yeah, in this no, we don't. Or uh, I suppose any of the, like, the rest of this building. I guess it's a very old building. Um, I think I parked behind the Nutmeg Conservatory. Okay. And, or no, behind the Warner Theater. That's where I, that's where I usually park yeah. when I'm like in this area doing mm-hmm. stuff. And I, but it's like, oh, but there's, I have to like jump a fence. Yeah. And, and uh, <laughs> Or something, and I figured, oh, I'll just, I guess I'll walk the long way around, like, to, like, I end up on East Main Street near, like, mm-hmm. the church. Yeah. And then I, you know, walked all the way, I mean, it's not not that bad, but still, like, since it is 60 today, and I guess I'm not, I'm so not used to it being 60 yet. Yeah. That I'm like, oh. Yeah, it's it's still January. Yeah. And it's 60 degrees out, it's crazy. Yeah, and, um, yep, I got sweat on my glasses, it was, uh, it was all, <laughs> <laughs> I, I was, I was thinking, oh, maybe I should wear contacts today because I assumed I would be doing some walking just to get to like the door and yeah. up, up to, to the office. But I was like, yeah, but, uh, I'll be fine. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You never know until you get out. You're, you're, uh, I think like we covered before, you're a, you're a classical. Yeah. Kind of I'm, opera I'm an opera singer. Um, I mean, I don't do a lot of, um, legit, I guess, opera anymore. I do a lot of the, um, uh, like neoclassical stuff. I've started singing jazz and rock again, which is great. I, um, that's kind of where my, my soul is. I'm, you know, classic rock and stuff like that. But, um, okay. yeah, I'm an actor, singer, um, teacher. Yeah. I found out uh, about you through, uh, Timothy Wallace. Yes. Who was just on, uh, he was just, he, he was a guest on the podcast, just, um, well, at least we recorded mm-hmm. our session just a few days ago. Mm-hmm. And, uh, he's a fascinating dude. Isn't he? he? Yeah. Yeah. He's, um, like, uh, I knew, I rough, I knew him vaguely mm-hmm. because I'm like, oh, there was that place on like Barber Street, yeah, Studio 59. Studio 59. I'm like, he ran up. He, he, yeah. First of all, I thought, oh, he runs that place. He owns that place. I'm like, but then I, I contact him and I started talking to him. He's like, yeah, blah, 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 Studio 59. He's like, oh, I haven't. That, that hasn't been yeah, a thing since a, like in a few years. I'm yeah. like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. It wasn't a pretty incredible place, but it just was, um, it was hard to get the numbers in the door. Yeah. You know, it was for some reason. I, I imagine it's because it was like the there was no parking. Yeah, <laughs> probably. Like it's on a one way street in Torrington, and mm-hmm. it's just this tiny little like converted church. Thing. Yeah, but the and the inside like the piano tuners would come in and be like, "Oh my goodness, the the acoustics in here is like Carnegie Hall. It's like Carnegie Hall." And like the the you know comments we were get we were getting. It's I mean it it was a pretty spectacular venue. It really really was. I mean if it was anywhere else but Torrington, I think it would have been you know. Really huge. Did you ever perform there? Yes. Um, I performed there. Tim and I produced shows there. Um, I produced my own shows there. I did a lot of... Um, I convinced a uh, sideshow performer, a friend of mine, to do Shakespeare there. He, and he, uh, he was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> but he'd never done Shakespeare before. He's a sideshow performer. The man actually holds a world record for, I think, the most piercing needles in the human body in under a minute. <laughs> and I had him doing Caliban from The Tempest. He was oh, okay. he was brilliant, but cool. he'd never done Shakespeare before. So I coached him and had him do 
had him do uh, Caliban and the Tempest. And what we did with that particular show is we set Shakespearean text with improvised piano. Tim would improvise the right. piano accompaniment. We had no rehearsals. Yeah. It was it was incredible. It was really fantastic. Yeah, we uh, Tim and I talked a lot about um, improvisation and how he started out being like in it, but improvising on piano even before he like had proper lessons and stuff. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And sure, he likes improvising, but he's not much of like you think. Given his penchant for um, improvisation. He'd be into like jazz, performing jazz and stuff. Right, but right. But he kind of isn't. Yeah, no, he's. Um, I don't know. It's not that he isn't. It's it's. Uh, I mean, it's not quite his bag. Ex well, it's not quite where he's going with his his improvisations are. are freer yeah you know jazz definitely has some structure underlying you know you have yeah, your unless you're talking yeah. like eric dolphy <laughs> uh, like mm -hmm. ornette coleman -y kind of stuff mm -hmm. but you know there's there's a lot of um i don't want to go into this but i'm asking like how well versed are you in jazz are you not really well i mean well perhaps well this might be edifying for you then because there's this thing where people tend to conflate the ideas of jazz and improvisation mm -hmm. they're like oh improvisation equals jazz and vice versa. Right. But the thing is, when we think of improvisation, it's literally, oh, you just do whatever the hell you want. Oh, yeah, that's what it means. Mm -hmm. But in the terms of like jazz, as we as it's usually performed, mm -hmm. it's definitely not that unless it is. There's, there's free a lot jazz. of there's a I know, but yeah. there's a lot of structure in improvisation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because when you think of improvisation in the jazz context, if you are a jazz uh, mm -hmm. musician, it's. You take a song, which has its own pre-existing, like chord progression. Yes, exactly. And you have your improvisation is you trying to play, trying to improvise a solo, a mm -hmm. melodic. Um, yeah, I was lucky enough in my undergrad to yeah. to have a lot of incredible uh, jazz professors. Yeah. Like I, I studied um, studied jazz in my undergrad. Yeah. They were fantastic. Yeah, and the, I feel like the big thing to understand is that you're playing. Like if you are, say, I don't know, you're playing saxophone, right? Mm -hmm. And you're improvising over the chord changes. Mm -hmm. You have to make sure your improvisation fits into... Or ends up fitting. Ends up fitting. You know, because there's, there's, there's that expression close yeah. enough for jazz. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> yeah, like the most conventional way to solo over a set of chord changes um, is like you hit chord tones. You right. have to make sure if you're doing it in that, like the most basic way, you have to make sure the notes you're playing are like, they've, they are notes within chords or they fit, mm -hmm. they kind of fit within the chords. Like they might be upper extensions. No, or like leading tones and things like that. You yeah. can, you can end up there. Yeah. And so, you know, that's, that's, um, as someone who tries to play jazz, I, Tries to play yeah, jazz. Try. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, it's a lot more than just, oh, I just do whatever the hell I want. Mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's so much more underneath that you have to think about because you're like, oh, wait, this, this chord change, but then like they're changing every two beats. Right. And then it's like, oh, but then I have to make sure like the, all the notes I'm playing kind of like they, they sound good because they like the voice lead in the next chord that's real, real mm -hmm. nice and whatever. You know, it's, lot, it's definitely a lot more involved than just, oh, I just play whatever the hell comes out of my mouth right, or right, my right. fingers. Right. You know? Yeah. I mean, um, there's also some security, though, too, in, in knowing the underlying chord structure. Yeah. Because a lot of people are really intimidated by free improvisation. Yeah. So knowing that there's an underlying chord structure and kind of understanding how you can manage your way through it, you can improvise with yeah. a little bit more security. There are some people who are even intimidated by the idea idea of improvisation even within a very i don't want to say constricted but structured way to, to like solo right like a lot of classical musicians i know they tend like hey you want to like improvise over this they're like i, I don't I, see I, here's the thing though for um vocalists especially if you're singing handel you need to know how to improvise although there are some definite definite uh, stylistic and leading rules um, if you're singing Handel, when you go to your, you know, A, B, and then A prime section, when you return to your main theme, you're improvising or doing someone else's improvisation of um, your ornamentation. Mm -hmm. So, because your your A section is straight, your B section is the sort of an exposition on the idea of the of the aria, and then you return to the A section with all the ornamentation. And so, if you're writing your own ornamentation, you're 
improvising, it ends up being structured when you're performing it. But when you're working out your um, your ornamentation, you're improvising. Yeah, sort of. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, when I said I try to play jazz, mm-hmm. uh, I'm not a I'm not formally trained in anything. Mm-hmm. I I play I would say my forte is guitar. I mm-hmm. play guitar and maybe some a bit of keyboard. But I like I have absolutely no formal training instrumental study. I feel like the I'm so fascinated by the world of jazz that I feel like if I the thing I aspire to be is a like a jazz guitarist. Yeah. And the I because I feel like the if I can play jazz, that's like a pretty that's a that's a high mark to get. Like I I like I feel like I know what I'm doing if I can do that. <laughs> mhm. You you are a singer, but do you do you have do you play uh, instruments like? I, I, um, I play a little keyboard. I play a little guitar. Um, but my main instrument is voice, and I do treat the voice like an instrument. Okay. I sight sing. I I read music. Um, so I'm I have a master's degree in uh, classical voice from NYU, as well as a uh, certificate in vocal pedagogy from NYU. I was a um, adjunct professor of voice at NYU uh, for a year as I finished my certificate there. I do treat the voice as an instrument. I actually had a conversation the other day about how there's vocalists that don't actually analyze the music underneath, you know, what they're singing. And in my, my, of course, entire argument was, well, you're part of an ensemble. You can't isolate the vocal line. You know, you, you're part of an ensemble. You need to understand the structure of the music underneath you and how you're a part of it. Yeah. So now I consider the voice an instrument. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, sometimes I do, and mm-hmm. um, although I'm not much of a singer, mm-hmm. I um, I think everybody is. Yeah. If, you, if you sing in the shower, if you <laughs> sing in your car, if you you know find yourself walking down the street humming, you're a singer. But, <laughs> well, um, I find there's a bit of a there's a disconnect between uh, my mind's ear mm-hmm. and like my larynx. Yeah. just like. I, um, that's a real thing. Actually, you do not hear your actual voice. No, the voice that's in your head is not your actual voice. No, you can actually, <laughs> if you sort of put your hands behind or put your hands oh, in yeah. front of your ears, yeah. you can hear a little bit better because it sort of blocks the, um, uh, the sounds that you're hearing in the front of your face, yeah. um, to be able to hear what's happening sort of behind you yeah. or with the sound that's bouncing off behind you. Yeah. So it, you can hear the sound that returns to your, your hands. Yeah. I'm just, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> there's. I, I can't match a pitch for anything. And really? I, I mean, like, eh, it's not like I have my I, I've been playing music for like maybe six years. Mm-hmm. And I did so much, say, studying in terms of I was learning by myself, like guitar things. Right. And like theory. Right. And not reading music. But that means I neglected like my ear. Uh, you, you can. No, I definitely yeah. did. You I definitely did. did. Okay. <laughs> no, I was like, I'm such a nerd for like learning the nuts and bolts of it all that. So, I was just, but I was your just, ear, your ear is part of the nuts and bolts of it all. I don't know is. if you ever <laughs> learned like, you know, sight singing or solfege yeah. or, you know, how, how things fit together in that respect. There's, there's a whole other puzzle to solve there yeah, as there well as your written theory. So, um, I actually just started, um, uh, with one of my students doing, doing sight singing. Um, it's something that I do often. I don't, I don't have a lot of students right now. I used to have a very big load of students. Um, but now because I have my son, I basically just sort of teach a couple of students during the day. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm a student at the uh, University of Hartford mm-hmm. where I'm minoring in music. Okay. And of course, part of the curriculum would be like an ear training course or two. Yes. Right? And I tried to take one last summer. Uh-huh. It did not go well. Oh, no. Because... Um, like I said before, I have absolutely no formal training aside from like a couple of theory courses I had taken in like the year previous. Yeah. And I walk in, it's, it's a summer course, which means it's like accelerated. It's accelerated, We're yeah. meeting, I'm meeting, going, I'm driving there like three times a week for like a maybe two-ish hour session mm-hmm. per day of, of ear training. Right. And, you know, I've, I've literally never, haven't spent any significant amount of time say, training my ear. Mm-hmm. And so not only that, but there were two other students. Not only were they actually 
had musical training. Yeah. But they were both vocalists. Oh, that can be so intimidating. So I was like, oh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, the one thing I like, um, I dislike about a lot of the textbooks that teach, um, ear training is that they're, they're, they move far too fast. Yeah. Um, for me, I end up writing, um, sort of interim exercises because once you, you know, go through one of the example exercises, you know it. It's no longer sight reading. Mm -hmm. So if you move on to the next one, you know, you're not, you know, reinforcing the skill enough. You know, if you're moving on to the next concept too quickly. So I end up writing my own sort of um, exercises for my students, like yeah. in between each each uh, yeah. concept. Yeah. And um, the I ended up dropping the course. Oh, because, I'm sorry to hear that. Well, because well, for one, because I wasn't I'm pretty sure I wasn't ready. Mm -hmm. And since there were two other students who could, you know, like move light years beyond me, I, you know, I had trouble keeping up. Mm -hmm. It's just I. I feel, I mean, I guess for some people, it comes easier. And, it can. But. So I, let me tell you, like clinical amusia, it's like, you know, the inability to match pitch or the inab yeah. inability to like repeat a melody or yeah. clinical amusia is like less than 2% of the population. Yeah. So I'm not saying I'm tone deaf mm -hmm. because I know I'm not. Yes. I no, can, I've, I've yeah. actually taught a couple of people. I've had many, actually many students over the years that have come to me specifically because I can't match pitch. I want to sing in church choir or I want to do this or I just, I just want to be better for myself, but I can't match pitch. I can't carry a tune. And, um, I mean, the first step is changing the language. Of course you can, you just need some practice. Um, one of the tools that I use, um, of course I don't have an acoustic piano here, but an acoustic piano. If you're having trouble matching pitches, try to match pitches with an acoustic piano because the resonance of the piano yeah. can help you find the resonance in your body. Yeah. It's all feel. Yeah. I've noticed, mm -hmm. um, when, once in a blue moon, when I'm able to match a, a pitch, mm -hmm. I do notice the change in resonance. In, yes. In like, it feels like, you know, they match up and it feels like the, the resonance expands. It's like doubling or whatever. Yes, yes, you know? yes. That, that, it can feel like that. Yes. I, I just wish it was able to happen more often. You know, yes. Just, For consistency, you need practice. That's, yeah. that's the only way to get there with anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And during that, I ended up dropping the class because I knew it wasn't going to end well because... I was having real trouble. Like even I would, I drove, I remember for the first like assignment, mm -hmm. I drove there really early in the morning and, and the class itself took place at like 9 a.m. or something, mm -hmm. right? Oh, I had and 9 a.m. And I sat in class. a practice room with a piano. I'm trying to do this exercise mm -hmm. and I, I got maybe half of it. I was able to get maybe half of it. Yeah. And then I, that class starts and turns out I misunderstood the assignment. Oh no. And like, Oh, I was supposed to do the hand signs. Oh, the hand like, signs. Mm hmm. Um, one bar ahead of what I was supposed to be sight singing. Oh, that's funny. And I'm like, Oh, I thought I was, I thought that was the extra credit bit. Mm -hmm. Like I thought I, I barely, I can barely do this straight. Mm -hmm. I, pr I, I practice it straight and I can barely do it. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> that's Yeah. <laughs> When did you first start singing? Oh my God, I've been singing since I could talk. And, and I spoke very early. Singing has been uh, part of my, my entire life. I've been singing. I always thought that I actually communicated better when I sang. Um, there, were, there are things that I need to say, like for, for my psyche, for my being. Like there are things that I need to communicate that I can't put into words. And I think that's a lot, it's like that for a lot of people okay. where I can express the things that I can't find the words to express through music. And it's always been that way for me. So I've always been a singer. You know, a, sing, um, be, a singer is the only thing I've ever wanted to be aside from Indiana Jones. <laughs> I also wanted to be Indiana Jones. <laughs> mm. uh, when did you start studying formally? Studying formally? I think I, did, I waited until I was in high school. I think... Um, I did a lot of theater and theater camps and stuff as a kid. Uh, but as far as like training in like classical music, I started in high school. Um, I started with, you know, of course, the Italian art songs, the 24 Italian art songs, pretty standard uh, for for young voices. And um, but I moved up to, to full full arias pretty quickly. Um, one of my teachers called me a wunderkittish, you know, <laughs> wonder child. So I moved up to arias pretty quickly and, and was just um, fascinated with 
opera and singing and voice and but I always was flexible I, I sang musical theater as well as opera as well as rock as well as jazz I just I sang everything um you know and and as I as I got older you know I always had this interest in sound production like actual human sound production and oh. and like even the neuroscience behind voice and the, and and um the physiology of the voice so I did a lot of the research on my own and um but what really um and then I, I of course have the certificate of vocal pedagogy from NYU where I did a lot of study in um in vocology where there's a um mix of you know, speech language pathology and techniques of singing and um, the science behind it. And uh, that was, you know, sort of sealed the fascination of um, the science of voice production. Right. Yeah. Or d- science is of voice production yeah. because there's there's a lot of different things. There's the physics, there's the physical and the mental. So my, in my teaching, I try to integrate a lot of that. Is there a part of vocal pedagogy that you think is like the most difficult to 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 teach to someone initially oh yeah what's the do you think there's one there like one bit that everyone has trouble with there is one point every single singer has trouble with and it's self-judgment everyone who sings everyone who makes a sound everyone who sings in their shower sings in their car walk sings walk down the street even professional singers the your biggest enemy, the biggest thing that everyone struggles with is your own self-judgment. And that is a mental block to real, free, healthy singing. Because singing is a very mental thing. And uh, so that is definitely, hands down, the one thing everyone struggles with in, in starting to sing or even being advanced. I have to give myself my own talks sometimes. Mm-hmm. You know, I tell my, you know, I'm very, very good at coaching my students through things like that. And I have to, you know, give myself my own advice <laughs> from time to time. Maybe the thing that took me a long time to understand was um, the role resonance plays within a vocal production. Yes. Because I, well, First of all, it's difficult for me because I don't keep, I don't take care of my voice. Mm. Um, you would think as um, someone who's a musician who quote unquote tries to sing and like speaks into a microphone mm-hmm. semi, semi-professionally that I would try to take care of my voice, but I don't. I'm not going to shame you, but I'm going to tell you your vocal folds, your entire mechanism are the size of a dime mm-hmm. and the external layer, the epithelial layer is the same stuff as the whites of your eye. So if you can imagine Smoking, if you can imagine um, getting something in your eye, if you can imagine rubbing your eyeballs together, yeah. you know, <clears throat> and, and the irritation that that would cause, that's what's happening to your vocal yeah. folds. So I won't shame you for not taking care of your voice, <laughs> but I'll remind you, size of a dime yeah. and the whites of your eyes. <laughs> yeah, and um, going back to what I said about resonance, mm-hmm. the, um, for the longest time, I didn't understand you need to like have air flowing through your head. Probably the most important thing I've learned as uh, about vocal production is you need to have air like flowing through your nostrils. Yes. You need so nasal through, resonance. The in, through the entire system. So I shy away from the term nasal resonance because people think that's going to produce a nasal sound. No. But the actual nasal sound is actually cutting off the resonance in your nasal cavities. Yeah. That's, that's how that nasal sound happens mm-hmm. is you're cutting off resonance. Yeah. So... The, where residence happens is in your sinus cavities. Those are the empty spaces in your head that produce that sort of chamber echo yeah. that results in the resonance. Yeah. The way I think about it is like, so say if you were just speaking from your chest and with no nasal resonance, like you're really kind of shouting and you're not thinking about it. Mm-hmm. All of it's just coming through your mouth. Right. And that's how it sounds like. So, but mm-hmm. like if you want, that's just yelling. If mm-hmm. you want to project to really get like a part of the voice that resonance that really like cuts, mm-hmm. it you need to have nasal resonance air flowing through your nose. Right, right, and it is it is resonance that actually helps your voice to carry. It's not so much your, you know, projection. It's not yelling that helps your voice to carry because if you're in a specific frequency, um, in a room where everyone's talking, if you're still in that modal talking frequency frequency there's no amount of yelling that's going to get you heard across the room yeah but if you raise your voice a little bit like if you can raise the pitch of your voice it can you just tune into where um 
your voice clicks naturally into your own resonance, then you're going to be heard across the room. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's there's a concept. It's the source filter concept. So airflow doesn't stop even when your vocal cords are adducted, meaning closed, because they're not really closed. They're sort of opening and closing um, as they're vibrating. But there's a source. The source filter concept is so the source is the vocal fold, the source of the vocal folds. It's the source of sound. Your filter is the shape of your mouth and your resonance cavities. And that is sort of like the bell of a trumpet or it's the it's the shape that creates your vowel consonant resonance. It's it's what forms the sound. So both of those need to be integrated with um the breath, which is another sort of point of struggle for some people too. Yeah. So it has to be it has to be an integrated system. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The one thing I might struggle with is mm-hmm. um the idea of from what I from what I can tell, it's all about like posturing. Posture Making, can play a really big oh, role in terms in of it. like finessing like muscles inside your head, the rest of your body to make sure everything's aligned correctly to make to um in order to have everything in a correct, a favorable position. To, favorable is a good word, yeah. To, to produce what you what you want. And mm-hmm. a lot of it is not intuitive because you can totally say like, hey, uh, lift your arm. That's very easy. Right. Hey, uh, lift your soft palate. I'm like, well, how do what you do that? What is that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so yawn. Yep. That's it. That's it. Feel like a yawn. Yeah. I the way that I teach is I'll give roundabout directions to get what I want and then I'll explain it. Yes. Because trying to tell somebody lift your soft palate or like relax your shoulders or like to give those physical directions just creates more body tension. I want you to release, not relax, release. Mm-hmm. Because that is the the only way you're going to get a sound that is well, released, <laughs> you know, um, and if you're constantly sort of nitpicking, then you're not addressing that one big thing that everyone struggles with. And, that, and that's that self judgment. You're if you are directly saying, lift your soft palate, relax your shoulders, lower your diaphragm, if you're constantly using directives with that language, it's not constructive teaching. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry to all the teachers that use that language. I mean, it's perfectly clear and fine. But for me, I don't like to use that kind of directive. My main concern with my students is that they feel free to sing. Mm -hmm. So (laughs) what's, what would you say is the the thing people can, it might be like most, you find people seem to be like, be most proud of, or like the, the thing, like once they finally understand it's like the, it opens like the floodgates to actual progression in their, in their development. It's totally different for everyone because it's totally different for each sort of habit that you've developed over your life that might Mm -hmm. be impeding your voice. But I think if I had to say one thing that really unlocks really great, healthy singing would be breathing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Realizing have, breath. Is. Breath. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, a lot of people, this language of breathe from your diaphragm, I think, is yeah. is a little misleading. Your diaphragm, you know, it, it is a muscle, but your diaphragm is this bowl underneath your lungs. It, you know, expands throughout your entire body. It basically cuts your viscera off from your lungs. Yeah. And um, when you breathe in, that bottom of that bowl is descending and you actually have no real voluntary control over that. Mm -hmm. It's a completely involuntary bodily process. You know, you need to breathe to stay alive. And it just creates this um, sort of, well, it creates basically suction that fills your lungs. So your lungs are actually filling without you having to (gasps) suck in air. I think when people are given the directive of, you know, lower your diaphragm or take a deeper breath, like there's this tendency to stiffen and to pull and it just, it creates another block. When I'm teaching breathing, I'll teach things lower. I actually teach breathing with laughter <laughs> <laughs> because the support muscles are actually sort of the same ones that you use when you laugh. And those are sort of your more your abdominal muscles and your costal muscles. 
And so I, I teach a lot of breathing with a lot of laughter. Not only is it activating the right muscles, but it's a little bit more fun than giving directives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, when you were coming up, would you say the mechanics of vocal production came easily to you? Or is there anything you ever struggled with? I think I still struggle with breath. And if I have to be like really nitpicky with myself, it's tongue tension. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's the big biggie for me in my in my uh, sort of because I switch vocalize. I like I switch vocalisms. I sing classical music. I sing rock. I sing jazz. And so layering style on top of, you know, good singing. I mean, good singing is good singing across the board. You add style on top. But for me, I have sort of a hard onset speech habit which is is hard onset vowels. It's mm -hmm. like a closure right before your vowel sound. Right. Uh -huh. And that's my bad habit. But then it creates tongue tension for me. And uh, that's a problem because the root of your tongue connects to the bottom of your, the, the base of your mouth, the floor of your mouth, which then goes to your hyoid bone. And the muscles from the hyoid bone then attach into your... Um, a thyroid cartilage and the thyroid cartilage is what houses the cricoid well the cricoids right underneath the cricoid cartilage and your vocal folds mm -hmm. and when you've got tension there you're pulling it out of whack mm. so and was there any like when you first were very very first learning how to quote unquote sing properly mm -hmm. what was there a thing that you couldn't like you couldn't get that so when i was really really first learning it was all about singing songs it was all repertoire stuff and mm -hmm. you know it, it really depends on the teacher you get you know and, and it really depends on um what your aims are you have to be really realistic with yourself about what your aims are and what you want out of a singing teacher so for me at the beginnings of my training because i didn't really have an option and i didn't really know what i was looking for mm -hmm. um was just a lot of repertoire. I just, you know, give me something and I'll sing it. Just give me something and I'll sing it. You know, I was really just hungry for repertoire. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I was older that I really, and I started singing arias. Like when I, it was after I started singing opera that I really wanted to know the mechanics of my voice. And initially I did a lot of research on my own, you know, because I had a teacher at that point that was giving me these directives, you know, relax your shoulders lower your diaphragm, you know, giving me these, these directives. And I wanted to know why I wanted them explained to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I wanted to understand the mechanics within my body for myself so that I could find the most natural way that I accomplished that mm -hmm. because it can feel different for everyone else. I mean, the thing about teaching piano is you can say, okay, this is middle C, here's the key. You can play it. I can show it to you. It's front of you. You can touch it. When you're teaching voice, I, I can't go in and touch your vocal folds and say, here, put them there. You know, like mm -hmm. I can't do that. Um, and a teacher can't do that. It's all, you know, giving you the tools to self-examine. Mm -hmm. And that's why I use that like positive language. Because I don't want self-judgment. I want self-examination. All right. Mm -hmm. When would you say your actual singing career starts? Do you, would oh, you say goodness. it's like... It's I think I was about 16 when okay. I was started getting like my first paid paid gigs. All right. Like I was, so you I were was, still in high school? Yeah, I was and still in high school. I was, and you were like in a choir and all that? I, yeah, of course. I was in high school choir. I did the, the shows. Although I was, um, I was a techie. Uh, I was a theater techie. I, I oh. hardly ever was on stage in high school, actually. Okay. Um, I was a techie. And because I did a lot of community theater, I did theater outside of school. Oh, okay. So that's when I was on stage. So in, in high school, I was a techie. Uh, my claim to fame is that uh, I built the plants for a little shop of horrors. I built oh, them okay. and I puppeteered <laughs> them. I actually was the puppeteer. Cool. And I actually did that for several years after high school as a business. I had, the, you know, my girls because yeah. <laughs> my, my plants were always girls. That show is so much more compelling when you have a really sexy female voice as the plant. <laughs> Because it is so much more convincing that a sexy female voice is con in convincing this person to murder for her. Like, it's just so yeah. much more convincing. So more, more often than not, my plants were women. But yeah, I was a, I was a techie in high school. And mm -hmm. this was in New Jersey? Yes. Mm -hmm. where, where in Jersey? Hackettstown, New Jersey. Okay. Mm -hmm. Forgive me if I don't know the geography of New Jersey. Oh, of course. That's, what, what is that, northern? or? Yeah, north, northeastern. Yeah. Okay. Or Northwestern, Northwestern New Jersey. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Northwestern New Jersey, does that mean like you went 
into New York a bit or? It was more, more towards Pennsylvania. Was, oh, right. Yeah, okay. more towards Pennsylvania. Um, but I was in and out of New York quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Okay. And did you, does that, you, did you ever like go to show up, perform at things and like felt in Pennsylvania or? Uh, what do you mean? Like, did I ever perform in Pennsylvania? Yeah, like, did, does, if you were that close, does that, does that mean you had, like, did you ever go to gigs in Pennsylvania? Yeah, or? I had gigs all over the place, actually. I um, I have performed, gosh, I mean, even in Seattle, I was in with a friend of mine. I, I produced my own sort of one-woman show for a while where I did opera arias and talked about them because I found that people, you know, said they didn't like opera simply because they didn't understand it. Oh. So I pr- kind of produced my own show where I would talk about classical song and classical opera, um, you know, cl- and opera arias and explain them and, you know, tell stories. And I produced this show. I did it with a friend in Oh, well, I mean, that wasn't really the whole show, but we did that in Seattle. And then um, I performed in New York. I've performed here in Connecticut. I've performed in Pennsylvania. Of course, New Jersey. Um, I'm trying to think if I ever did anything more Southern. But I think that's about it. That one woman show kind of sounds like um, a TED Talk about opera and punctuated with like performances kind of mm-hmm. like you like opera you just don't know it yet. It, yes <laughs> so th- i actually did give a ted talk um i gave a tedx talk in jersey city some years ago uh oh gosh actually like you know seven years ago now was, i was very pregnant with my son under an old stage name and it was uh titled the necessity of singing Mm-hmm. And it was about, you know, how everyone sings and how I believe that neurologically, specifically neurologically, we need singing. Singing is the only like very real human superpower. Kind of, yeah. It's everyone has this and it's a very real human superpower. You know, uh, breaking, breaking a wine glass with your voice, that's not a myth. People can do that. It is, it is a thing that happens. There's been protests rallied with with singing there's been people with like parkinson's and neurodegenerative diseases um can regain their walking gait or regain function of their bodies using rhythm and music using dance using music um people who have broke as aphasia from stroke or traumatic brain injury like lose the ability to speak mm-hmm. but can retain the ability to sing Right. And through melodic intonation therapy, they can be rehabilitated to use singing to rehabilitate speech. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of times that can be surprisingly effective. So it is truly a real human superpower. One of my Instagram hashtags is singing is my superpower. <laughs> so, um, but I, I truly believe that it is a human superpower. It does so much for your brain and so much for your body simply to listen to music um, to participate in music does even more. Um, there's there's a concept called entrainment. If you are in a group, this is maybe speci- I'll I'll specifically say like drumming. If you're in training in rhythm with like a group, you'll find so much of your body rhythm or your heartbeat, even your breathing rate, will sync up with the people, the rest of the people in that group, simply because you're drumming in the same pattern. Yeah. So. It- it's called like phase locking. Phase locking. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's, that's where I come from in my mission of, of teaching singing is, is to help people feel like it really truly is a superpower, that it's mm-hmm. saying all the things that you can't find the words to express, that it's you know unlocking these skills that you have and connecting you to your body in a positive way that helps you find your voice quite literally and help you, you know, relate to the world in that way. Yeah. So that's, that's my underlying mission in teaching voice. I mean, of course, I love teaching classical diction. I sing in German, French, Italian, Latin, Czech. Um, I've sung in Icelandic, which is crazy. I will never, not ever have an Icelandic accent. I will never be believable. But uh, the music is incredible. I love teaching diction. I love teaching theory. I love teaching sight singing, you know, and, and musical concepts. But I think my main mission in, in teaching voice and in teaching people to sing is healthy vocal production and making sure that they really feel like this is them. You know, one of the biggest things is, you know, I have I have people come to me, oh, I want to sing like Beyonce. I want to sing like this person or like this person. And it's like, how do I get you to realize you sing like you. Yeah. You know, you can you can sing that music, but you will always sound like you. And that is incredibly special because there is no one else that sounds like you. 
You have to find out what it is that you are putting out into the world and, and learn to truly love it, embrace it, capitalize on it. You know, no one can do what you do, especially with your voice. It's like a fingerprint. It's no one else's. So, you know, take care of it and nurture it and love it. Yeah. You know, it, I don't know. I, I personally have a problem with self-comparison as well. I, when I sing rock, I, I, I sound like a very angry Disney princess. <laughs> like, I just, I sound like a very angry Disney princess. But that's, that's my own hang up. Like, I can still do it. I still, you know, it's still healthy production. It's still the right technique. It's still the right style. But I sound like an angry Disney princess. <laughs> but that's just my voice. That's what my voice does. Like, classically, the... Um, Umbrella category I fall under is uh, Soubrette. Uh, Soubrette is like, uh, sings characters like Despina, although I've seen Mezzo sing Despina, um, or Susanna in uh, Marriage of Figaro. Um, sort of the funnier, lighter characters that are like the maid or the sister or the, mm-hmm. you know, the, the funnier characters, which is great because I'm funny. <laughs> At least I think I'm funny. But um, when I sort of translate to the other styles, that, that sort of me is still there. Yeah. So I have to, you know, run that style and run that heart through, you know, my own filter. You know? Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. There's something about people not understand, like the sound of your voice is the sound of your voice. Yeah. And so sometimes you might have to maybe sacrifice some ambitions in order to pursue something that better fits the timbre of your voice. Like say, at least at this current moment, I feel like, even though I'm, I think in my heart of hearts, I'm just like a guy who likes rock music. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, yeah, I would love to, you know, sing like Dave Grohl. Yeah, or, you can or, do that. Or Chris Cornell. Yeah, you can and, do that. But, you know, given if I were, I feel like if I were given my knowledge uh, of my own, my own voice it's and its timbre, I feel like if I were to like, say, pursue singing seriously mm-hmm. and really, really get the technique down, the, the timbre that it would produce it probably sound very pop, you mm-hmm. know, as, as opposed to what I would want to do is like sing like rock. You can still have, cause it's technique. It's things that are layered on top yeah. of technique. Like there's that growl that you can do. Like there's, and then there's the, the Christian Chenoweth, you know, you can <laughs> get it up there. Um, so you, there are, there are definite ways to use your voice to get, you know, closer to the sound you want. I mean, you think about, you know, people who are trans who are transitioning they go they come to vocal coaching yeah. because they want to feel more like themselves mm-hmm. and they can be really constructively guided to take what they have and take the sound that they have and and guide it to a technique and to use that feels more like the person that they truly are mm-hmm. and the person that they're transitioning transitioning to be so though i say that the voice you have is the voice you have if you want to sing rock and you want to learn those techniques, you can do it. Yeah. And I'm sure you can do it. You want to learn the, if you want to learn to scream, ah, like it's all the, the metal scream. Mine is always higher than, but uh, you can do it. The metal scream is all microphone, by the way. <laughs> um, you can do the, you can do anything you want with your voice. It just, it just takes proper technique and guidance. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Where did you go for undergrad? Undergrad, I hopped around quite a bit. I started, I put myself through two years of community college. Mm-hmm. I was uh, I was actually teaching voice lessons back then. Uh, I, was, I started teaching voice lessons. I was mentoring under um, someone and, and teaching voice lessons and working at a Home Depot. And uh, I was actually teaching Taekwondo. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I was, I was a lot of odd jobs to put myself through. Two years of community college. Um, I was very lucky that I took AP classes in high school, so I had a whole semester of college done before I even started, which was amazing. And then from there, I went to the College of New Jersey, but I wasn't even there a semester when I died. I actually, um, yeah, I I flatlined in the OR. I um, Well, why were you in there in the first place? mm -hmm. So didn't know at first, but I I, um, was bleeding to death internally. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So I had had an ovarian cyst that ruptured, and I went to the ER because I was feeling really sick. Lips were turning blue, couldn't keep even water down. And they said, oh, you have an ovarian cyst, go home. Put your feet up. You're (laughs) fine. No. 
So my doctor didn't even look at me. She looked at the CAT scan that they took at that hospital and they admitted me for surgery immediately. And I very nearly did not make it. That was, I mean, I could go on about that experience because it was trippy for the next couple of days. (laughs) Like I, um, like my heart was working. I was not allowed to sleep. I was not allowed to sleep for about 24 hours or it was maybe 16 hours or so. I was not allowed to sleep because they were worried about my body shutting down. Yeah. Uh, so I, but my heart was working so hard to beat that the entire bed was shaking. No, it was, it was insane. It was just so, so wild. When I finally, I I got two blood transfusions after that. When I got the first unit of blood, it was like two seconds. I was instantly asleep. It was just like, cause my body had been working so hard to stay alive, yeah. you know, for the past, you know, eight hours or so that when that hit me and it was like the most immediate physical realization of I'm going to be okay. And I fell asleep. <laughs> so after that, I took some time off, you know, I had one of those weird epiphany experiences where I had this crazy dream and, uh, I had to follow it. And so that's when I started doing my one woman show and I made this gigantic like red silk Victorian bustle gown and I started doing these these shows at conventions and things like that. And and so I took like a, a year and I was doing these shows and at conventions and I was selling I was making and selling jewelry, uh, just as a side business. And then I took myself to Italy to train. I actually got to um work with uh Nico Castell, who is this incredible tenor, uh, before he passed away. Uh, actually, Enzo Ferrari, I got to have a couple of coachings with Enzo Ferrari. Enzo Ferrari was um, Maria Callas' voice coach. Oh. So I got to work with her. I got a couple of coachings with her. I stayed in Spoleto, Italy, which is, the, of course, the home of the very famed Spoleto Festival. And um, I came back and I, I realized, well, you know what? I'm, I got to finish. I got to finish. And I, my mother, you know, sort of let me do my own thing for a while, like, but this experience sort of traumatized everybody. So she was really pushing me, you got to finish your degree and you're going to go here. And it was Moravian College in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And I was really, really lucky in that Moravian, I got to have a master class with um, uh, Bobby McFerrin. I got to meet and perform with him. And also with Frederica von Stad, I got to meet and perform with and learn from her. And also had those jazz professors there. They had a huge jazz department there. And so I learned a lot of jazz and a lot of different kinds of music there. They, you know, the um, like world music and things like that was really big there too. But the one thing they didn't have was musical theater. And so I sent a, you know, an email out. I said, why don't we have this here? And the response I got was, we don't have the talent. <laughs> we don't have the talent here to do that. And I just thought, oh, no. You want to see you want to see talent? I will show you talent. I put out a campus white email and I said who want, who's interested in this and there were 50 people some odd people that showed up to that meeting and I said, "Oh no, I guess I have to do this now." <laughs> so I founded uh, Moravian College's very first musical theater company. It was a student company and I produced um a couple of um, cabaret type shows and we became student government recognized. We did fundraisers. Uh, They ended up getting their own on-campus house. We produced the show Godspell, working with Music Theater International when I I secured the rights. So I was like the producer, director. I ran this whole thing. When I graduated, uh, they hired a PhD to continue a musical theater program at the school. So I'm a bit of a bull in a china shop. <laughs> don't tell me we don't have the talent. Don't tell me that someone can't do something because I will show you they can. You know, like I'm a bull in a china shop. All right. So from there, I took another year where I was just performing. I was working as a working performer and I did I did a lot of weddings and things like that, too. I then decided, you know, I really wanted to go to grad school and I went to NYU and I was there for classical voice performance. I did a lot of the operas there, learned quite a bit. I worked with a lot of amazing people and did my pedagogy certificate there. So I have my graduate degree, my master's in classical voice, and my advanced certificate in vocal pedagogy from <laughs> NYU. Mm-hmm. Sorry to backtrack, but I'm yeah. curious I'm curious to know, like, what was the time frame between being operated on? How long was it from then until you, like, recovered enough to go back to school? Oh, it was a long time. It was it was a long time. So that happened spring semester, summer. But I think I went. I think I went back. Did I go back that fall, or did I? 
I'm actually not sure. That was 2004. It was a year. Well, because I went back in 2005. Yeah, I went back in 2005. Because it was, it was October, October 13th, 2004. So no, it was that September. Oh. It, was, it was the spring semester and the summer. And then I went back to school. Oh. Mm-hmm. And uh, when, when did you complete your studies at NYU? Um, when did I graduate? I officially graduated with everything in um, 2013. Okay. Mm-hmm. How, was, how was the experience um, NYU? being at, at NYU? Oh, it, was, it was awesome, but there were definitely things that, um, that sort of, there were definitely things I was incredibly unhappy with. A lot of the new faculty and the new administration in their vocal department has really addressed a lot of these concerns that I had. So I'm, I'm really proud of the school now. Um, they, they've, they're, especially in their, the pedagogy, in the, in the vocal pedagogy department, they've done a lot where they're integrating with their, um, their SLP degrees now. Mm-hmm. And so their vocal pedagogues will now go and work with the, the speech pathology students and actually see and do like stroboscopies and things like that, where you can actually see the functioning of someone's vocal cords, mm-hmm. you know, vocal folds. They're not cords. They're folds. <laughs> anyway, so, um, the advancement in that department is something to be really, really proud of. But at the time, um, it was sort of a newer thing for them. And, um, yeah, I'm going to say it. I had an issue with, with the, like, the supervising professor uh, and some favoritism. But uh, he's no longer teaching there. So <laughs> that's, yeah. Okay. But, uh, yeah, it was um, being in New York, and I lived in New York and Jersey City while I was attending, was a pretty incredible experience. Because not just for the school, but because of the culture and the opportunities that were afforded to us as students. I mean, we got student student tickets to the Met. We got student tickets to the museums. We got student tickets. I mean, it was just it was affordable to be in New York and experience the culture of New York, like rabidly consume culture as a student. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Were there any musical performances you got got to see that uh, stick in your mind? Let's see. Um, musical performances that I got to see that stick in my mind. <laughs> I could tell you probably the funniest story, probably the worst production of an opera I ever saw, <laughs> I'm sorry to say, was at the Met. <laughs> it was a French opera called Effigny en Torride, and it unfortunately, starred Susan Graham and Placido Domingo because they're, like, incredible. They are, I mean, everybody knows who Placido Domingo is. Like, the choreography, there was a, a thing where there were these priestesses, and the choreography for the priestesses looked like really bad sign language. So I was sitting there with my friend interpreting this, and it was like, I'm putting on my helmet, and I'm going home on my skateboard. I'm putting on my helmet. And, I'm, and we were just like, we couldn't stop laughing. And it was just... So, and then there was another instance when, so Placido's character is um, a prisoner and they take him in and they're, they're supposed to be beating him. And it was so obvious that the chorus was terrified to touch Placido Domingo. They didn't want to touch him. They were so petrified. They mm. were like utter, utterly starstruck. They were like just miming this. And it could have been the stage direction to just mime it. Yeah. But like, and you know, and he kind of sits down on the floor when he's supposed to be thrown on the floor. But then they start like whipping him with these like silk scarves. And I was like, what are we in a locker room? Like, what is going on? <laughs> and it was just the way that it was staged. Like, we just couldn't stop laughing at how hokey it was. And I, I, I can't tell. I missed all of the music. <laughs> I just missed it because I was far too busy, just mind blown at the staging and how distracting it was. <laughs> You know, th- so there was that. Um, but the other one, and I want to, you know, talk about an incredible experience was um, uh, Philip Glass's opera um, Satyagraha. There were a couple of things in there because, you know, Philip Glass's music is utterly impossibly hard to perform because it's so there's so much repetition. Yeah. And, and then within the repetition, there's some variation and then it's not and then variation and not. And so there were a couple instances where there were a chorister that came in too early. But it, it wasn't like there was one once that it was funny. But um, <laughs> they had those giant puppets and there was somebody who dropped one and then the, the guy in jeans had to come on and pick it up and bring it off. But that I want to say, you know, those were just things that happened. But overall, that opera and that experience was incredible because 
you follow these little vignettes of these people and it's Gandhi and, and these people, but you end up ending with Martin Luther King. And there's this realization that happens within the end of that opera. And I can't tell you how it happens because it's not, it's not incredibly blatantly set, but there is just this realization that happens as you're watching the staging and you're watching, it's, it's supposed to be Martin Luther King giving the, I I had to have a dream speech and the podium is just rising and rising and rising and rising and rising and rising. And you just sort of come to this realization that when you're facing these things, like these people, these great people are facing, someone has to stand up and it doesn't necessarily mean that they were superheroes. They were real people. They just stood up and they sort of, how do I say this? It was like the, you know, it wasn't like the position was given to them. It wasn't like they chose it. It, it happened and they accepted it. Mm -hmm. And it was this incredible wash of realization that kind of came over me and, and other people in the audience. And it was like the people who cried, we all started crying at the same time. And I can't tell you how it is Philip Glass constructed that moment, but it seemed to be kind of a universal audience experience that all of us just got it at that moment. Mm. It, it was just incredible. So, yeah, so those are some of the things that stick in my mind. Um, definitely my performances at the Met because I was involved in, in a lot of the student, student feedback and stuff at the Met. It was on a, like a student panel. Um, at the Met, and um, so I got to see a lot of shows for free, which was <laughs> oh, amazing. So the Met is definitely the sort of the one thing the performances stick in my mind because I saw a lot. <laughs> mm. mm -hmm. And uh, when did you come to Connecticut? I came to Connecticut when I got pregnant with my son. Okay. So that was uh, seven years ago now. You've been like since then periodically working with like doing productions at the Warner? Or? I've done a couple productions at the Warner. Um, yeah. I think the most notable one was I did, uh, I was Phoebe Dysquith in A Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder. Okay. And um, I won the onstage blog, um, Best Actress in a Supporting Role for the State of Connecticut, the, cool. the onstage blog regional right. awards. Um, and I, I don't know if the results are out yet, but I was nominated for uh, Broadway World's uh, Connecticut best actress okay um uh, the last time i looked at the polls i was like 13 in the polls <laughs> which was which was cool i mean it, just to be nominated for that was pretty pretty stellar but i you know i i i rarely do community theater i because i do it professionally mm -hmm. um i do community theater when it's something i really want when mm -hmm. i know it'll be fun right. when i know it'll be you know something i really want to do and want to put on my resume so i i did mary poppins i did because because I am the Poppins. I am Mary Poppins. <laughs> and, um, and then I did, I did Phoebe Dysquith. And um, those were things I really wanted on my resume. But my job for the past several years has been, I've been working with an off-Broadway immersive theater company. And they've been, we've been producing these shows. We did um, the Brothers Booth at the Players Club. Uh, I, I wasn't involved in one of them. It was the girl who hand up, handcuffed Houdini. Um, I was also in um, Speakeasy Dollhouse, The Bloody Beginning, which was actually very, very big. I was actually in Crane's New York Business. I was in the New York Times. I was in uh, BBC's Travel Magazine uh, for that one because that was that was pretty big in like this underground immersive theater experience mm -hmm. scene. Yeah. Um, and then the big one for the past couple of years has been the Illuminati Ball. And the Illuminati Ball is this like crazy... Uh, constructed situation that was based on the Rothschild Illuminati ball that happened in the 70s. Basically, very, very basically, a bunch of rich people came to pretend that they were very important. Mm -hmm. um, so, but this one has a really twisted aim and a really twisted experience. Mm -hmm. um, and the comic book just came out. So I'm, I'm in a comic book. <laughs> um, so the comic book or the graphic novel just came out through, uh, I think it was Titan, Titan Books. Um, and that's the, the Illuminati Ball by Cynthia Von Bueller. So there's, you'll see the, the character that I play in there modeled by me. So that's, that's been a pretty, pretty incredible experience to be so involved in such an integral part of this company that did so much in this like, 
burgeoning immersive theater scene in New York. You know, there's a lot of everybody knows Sleep No More, Sleep No More mm-hmm. it, by Punch Drunk. And, they, you know, because that started in Boston and then it went to New York and it, you know, because it's got a really high budget. But there's a lot of like sort of mid mid range budget and even low budget immersive theater projects coming out now because immersive theater, it is a mind blowing and can be life changing experience for, you know, actors and the audience. Because when you walk into that experience, you, you don't just sit there and observe, you become part of it. Um, my favorite one was uh, the Speakeasy Dollhouse, The Bloody Beginning, because it was actually based on the producer's grandfather. It was a true story. And uh, her grandfather was murdered in 1935. And the person that they arrested, um, that they are almost positive, did it. Uh, the case was dismissed. So, you know, he never served time. He was never, never truly really even tried for the murder. So she went back to her family and started asking why and how and who were these people. And then she had this dinner party and she goes, you know what, we're going to, we're going to play this out. You know, you play this person, you play this person, you play this person. She had a bunch of actors at a dinner party and it worked. It worked in this crazy way where, you the intrigue of the situation and people playing these roles just made this time nebulous sort of situation that could then be interpreted you know in many different ways mm-hmm. so she wrote the show and rewrote the show based on these these characters i mean you met uh, Judge Hulan Capshaw, you met Jimmy Hines, and these were people who were involved in like Tammany Hall and in politics in New York at the time. Uh, you got to meet uh, Dutch Schultz and uh, Lulu, who were bet gangsters. Uh, you got to meet her grandfather, who was played by her husband, which was adorable. <laughs> and um, you got to meet, you know, the murderer. But when you met the murderer, you met this sort of meek man who was very soft-spoken and very humble so the thing about this is is it wasn't a murder mystery you knew that the murder was going to happen you even knew who did it walking in the door Mm -hmm. but when you met this person like you know and you're face to face with them and they're suddenly nothing like you imagine this person to be how do you then react to that it starts you know psychologically you start reminiscing upon your own humanity, yeah. you know, when you're faced with these challenges, you know, um, and the person that played Dutch Schultz, um, in reality, his personality, he's a, he's a sweetheart, like an app, like the sweetest man. And as Dutch Schultz, he was a horrible human being, <laughs> horrible human being. Right. He played that character so well, like it, it would just, it would raise the hair on the back of your neck. For me, um, she wrote me in, I was the only person i was sort of the puck of of that story (laughs) because i was the only person that wasn't based on a real person so i sort of flitted between and i made sure that the audience got involved and made sure that the audience was asking questions and made sure that during the trial because during the trial at the end people were screaming and so i circled around the back of the crowd and made sure people heard what was being said and so made sure that the crowd was really involved and i would spread rumors and things like that people would leave this show changed you know, your psychology changes. And it's the same with like Sleep No More. Sleep No More will do that because, you know, there's no speech. It's all this movement and it's all this sort of nebulous um, experience. And it gets you to think. It gets you to think about your own humanity. And that's what's important about live theater. You know, if you want to get into the neuroscience, it's, you know, activating those um mirror neurons you know when you are sitting across from someone at a dinner table and you watch them take a drink and you then your body then goes and reaches for the glass and takes a drink too those are your mirror neurons firing and it's totally different from like watching something on tv or um you know watching youtube videos when you are watching live theater your brain is firing when you are in immersive theater your brain is your your mirror neurons are firing. You're you're relating to what's happening around you. You're observing what's happening around you. You're becoming part of what's happening around you, yeah. and that's transformative. So that's why I'm so proud of being involved in immersive theater because when it is done well and when it is structured in a psychologically, when you start considering the psychology of your audience and start constructing the situations with those sort of concepts in mind you've got something that's just, it's going to change people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool. <laughs> yeah. So that's what I've been doing for the past couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right. Well, uh, uh, we've gone on for a while. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, no. Of course, mm-hmm. no, no. It's um, it's fine. I did, no, this is a typical length of an episode, mm-hmm. and um, I would just I'd like to thank you. Oh, of course, for, for thank being you. on the show. Mm-hmm. I feel like there's so much more we could talk about. Oh, yeah. <laughs> or maybe you could come back later. Yeah, about, you know, the time I worked with Teller from Penn & Teller. Or how about, uh, <laughs> how about you know, when I was a professional pirate? Or, <laughs> yeah, I've got stories. <laughs> but again, I would like to thank you. And of also, course. I would like to thank Tim for for um always for, thanks, for, for Tim. referring He's a me to you. Man. Because mm-hmm. I'm always, I'm always look, looking for guests. And uh, I thought, oh, she, th- mm-hmm. this sounds like someone I would, I would love to talk to. So. <laughs> thank you. Well, uh, uh, all right. Yeah, thank you so much. Cool.